Hey, good morning. So glad you guys are here. Happy New Year. You're like, oh, there's a couple there for me. Thank you, man. That was like the weakest that's happened out of all three services. I expected you guys to be the most awake, and boom. Okay, so we'll just transition through that, because I heard you clearly on the monitor. If you're joining us on the other side of the monitor this morning, I want to say thanks for worshiping with us. When I think about that song, I was thinking uh, that we just got done singing, I was thinking about Paul's words. He's like, if I'm going to boast about anything, I'm going to boast about Christ in me. Because of his goodness to us, he breaks those chains in our lives and he sets us free, man. So glory to God uh, on that deal. Hey, let me ask you guys this question, which the first one didn't go so hot, so maybe we'll pick up from there. It's New Year's, and typically with New Year, looking for new hope, new directions, and so I bet that over the course of the past six days, you took time to reflect on what you want to see happen in 2019. So just by show of hands, how many of you have your resolutions and goals ready to go? Oh man, you could not see, you guys were the best out of all of this. There's still a bunch of people that don't want to raise your hand. You're holding coffee in the other. You don't want to spill. I get it. You just want to receive. You're like, Mike, just give it to me, man. And here we go. All right, cool. I get it, man. Um, I'll, I'll tell you this. I don't really like resolutions because it's kind of like we write them down and then we don't do much with them. But there are some things that I absolutely love about resolutions, and I just want to know if you guys have yours. The other night we were sitting down as a family, and I said, all right, guys, we need to have some goals for 2019. And I said, and I looked at my boys and I said, all right, I'm going to give you a goal this year. And do you know what they did to me? First, their eyes started to roll back in their heads, <laughs> followed by this weird sound coming out of their mouths that sounded like, oh, like, can't we talk about something else? And I said, all right, fellas, here's what we're going to do this year. In 2019, you are going to overcome your fear of spiders. And then their eyes rolled back some more and some more noises. I thought that'd be a great goal for them because what they've been doing for the first years of their life is sending their mother downstairs to slay the spiders. I was like, guys, there is nothing manly about that. And one day you will meet a woman and she is going to count on you and you cannot send her down there. <laughs> Just trying to help them out. So they quickly caught on. And the oldest one looks at me and he goes, okay, we'll overcome our fear of spiders when you overcome your fear of snakes. And do you know what I did? My eyes started to roll back in my head <laughs> and a noise came out of my mouth that sounded like, oh, they had me, man. But hey, that was one, like, that's one of our goals for 2019, overcoming a fear. I don't know what your resolutions are. Maybe you haven't even thought, maybe you've got some fears or maybe you don't even have one yet, but if you're looking for a goal resolution, maybe it's overcoming fear, maybe it's not like of arachnophobia or something like that. Maybe you're terrified of getting in an airplane because you think, dude, I don't want to go out like that. And so you just never get in one. They say it's the safest way to travel. Maybe you've got a fear that is deeper than that, though, that for you setting a goal in 2019 of learning to trust again would be a big deal because, man, some people have not been kind to you and you feel like you can't trust anybody or people that you're supposed to be able to trust, you haven't been able to trust. So maybe for you, the fear of trusting would be a good goal to say, I'm gonna learn how to trust again. Or maybe 2019, maybe it's your fear of loving because you're loving without any guarantees in return and that is absolutely terrifying for you. But maybe in 2019, you learn to love again and just put yourself out there and trust but you can start by receiving God's love so that you can put yourself out there. Maybe for you, 2019, when you think about, hey, here's where I need to go, maybe 2018 was a year of complacency for you. You just kind of feel like you're stuck in a rut. We've all been there. Maybe even this morning your heart's apathetic, and I would say then 2019, what you need to do if you're stuck in complacency, if you feel like you're stuck in a rut, you gotta do something new. Learn a new language. Get crazy. Try red hot yoga. Go ballroom dancing. Travel to some place you've never been before. I know that for each and every one of us, there is, a, there is a food item on a menu somewhere that you refuse to touch. You're like, it sounds disgusting. I would never put that in my mouth. Listen, man, you've been in complacency. You need something new. You try that thing this year, man. At the very least, it's something new. Get out of that rut that you're in. 
But maybe your rut is deeper than just complacency. Maybe your rut is in regards to your faith. Maybe you just feel like you're going through the motions this morning. And I would tell you that in 2019, it's not that you have to learn something new. It's that you gotta do something new. And what doing something new means is joining God in what he's already doing and stepping into the plans that he has for your life in 2019. If you don't know what they are, one of the things I'm so excited to tell you about is we have an area in our church, a ministry of our church, that is dedicated to this. It's called Go Central. It is not where you go and we say, hey, here's where we think you should go. It's like how we ask the question, how has how God gifted you? And we pair you up with how God's wired you to what he's already doing. And then we say, go. And that would you, be you stepping out of complacency. If you're looking for something to step out of complacency, uh, Chris told us about it. But man, after service, night to shine. Dude, prom. Prom may have been awful for you. It may have been awesome for you, but you can make prom fun for somebody else, man, our special needs guest. I think we're expecting somewhere over 200 to 300 people. Just come be a guest that night with us and help these kids celebrate. Easy way to get stuck out of, or get out of a rut. Maybe in 2018, what you, you thought is you've been, you've been carrying some baggage. There's some stuff going on in your life that you wish wasn't there. Here's, here's a goal for you in 2019. Here's a resolution for you. 2019, stop doing it. Maybe, maybe you've got a habit that's killing you from the inside out and it's hurting somebody else. Stop doing it. It's hurting you. Maybe it's a thought pattern. Maybe it's just a behavior. Stop. I know some of you are wishing I would tell you you could quit your job in 2019. <laughs> Don't do it. Don't do it without a backup plan, man. Unless you feel like God's just saying, hey, pull the, pull the parachute, take the leap of faith and go for it. But hey, if there's something that you need to quit, 2019, that's your year. Now we write these resolutions down and oftentimes we move on from them, but here's what I love about goals, here's what I love about resolution, here's what I love about goal setting, is all of them have this one thing in common and it's absolutely powerful, it's vision. Resolutions and goals deal with the economy of vision. You look, you see a picture of the preferred future. You see where you're at and you see where you want to go. And there is something compelling about that vision. There is something in your life that you want to move from where you're at to where you want to be. You see, vision is powerful. If you're taking notes this morning, I would tell you that vision is a picture of the preferred future. Some of you this year, you want to become more spontaneous. Some of you want to become more courageous. Some of you want to become more disciplined. Some of you want to be a better spouse. Some of you want to be a better parent. Some of you want to be a better employee. Some of you guys want to step into the plans that God has for you that you haven't experienced up to this point. That is vision. And the thing about vision is it's always clear. It's always compelling. It makes you want to do it. And it's always measurable. Well, today, what I'm going to do with, is what I'm going to do over the next few minutes is I'm going to share the vision that God wants to take Highland Park Community Church in over the next five years. I'm going to share with you where we're going. I'm going to give you a picture of the preferred future that God has for our church. But before I do that, I want to ask you, what are some visions that have been most inspiring to you? Like you, it has grabbed your heart and it has moved you from here to there. I look out and I can see some of you guys who practice medicine or want to practice medicine. Something about science and how God made chemistry and biology and a bunch of other big words that I can't say gripped your mind and gripped your heart and you said, I was made for this. And you wanted to go out and do it. I look out and see some of you today and there are some of you who are a stay-home parent because your parent was awesome and you want the same for your kids. And that vision of what you experienced was so gripping, you want that for your kids. Or maybe you didn't have a good experience and you want something better for your kids and that's why you're a stay home parent so that your kids could have something that you always wanted and it's that vision. And that's why you're like, man, I am proud to be a stay home parent where I can take care of my kids and give them something I've never had. I was out to dinner with some friends just a few weeks or a few months back. 
and uh, just catching up, hearing what was going on in life. And I said, hey, what's new with you guys? And they said, we're foster parents now. I think being a foster parent is inspiring. That you would have a heart big enough to open your life and your home to somebody who is desperate in need of love and care. And anytime I ever hear about somebody being a foster parent, I wanna know what is compelling you to do that? What is driving you to open your heart and your home like that? And the story, I, you, know, you know me, I'll cry in public, man, but I was almost crying in a restaurant. The mom, who was a foster mom, says, Years ago, the state had to take my kids away from me because I wasn't fit to be a mom. And my kids went into a foster home. And it was already a tragic situation, but the, the home that my children landed in made it worse. And my kids were taken advantage of in a very unhealthy way. And I want to make sure that nobody else's kids ever have to go through that. And I want to make sure that a confused kid knows how much God loves them. So we've opened up our heart and we've opened up our home. And I was like, dude, if, if more people heard this story, I think God would open up their hearts. I think God would up open their homes. Compelling, compelling vision that drives her to do this, that a kid would have a safe place that they would feel and know that they were loved by God. That was the vision. I was like, sign me up for that. Wow. So I asked you just a few minutes ago, what is a vision that you've heard that has gripped your heart that you're like, sign me up for that? Let me give you one. It's one that has already gripped your heart. In fact, I would tell you it is the most inspirational, it is the most compelling vision that has ever been given, and it is, the large, it is in large part that you are here today because of that vision. Please turn with me in your Bibles to Matthew chapter 13. It's a vision that Jesus gave. This is one of my favorite passages in all of God's word. It's one of my favorite verses. It's a parable. But in this parable, in this, in this one line, Jesus casts, a profound vision for you and I, and he invites us to be a part. And so with that being said, would you guys mind, would you, even if you do mind, just read it with me, okay? If you guys would read this along with me. Here we go, one, two, three. The kingdom of heaven is like a treasure hidden in a field. When a man found it, he hid it again. And then in his, went and sold all he had and bought that field. Leave it up there. I want you to take just a few seconds and I want you to meditate on what Jesus is saying. I just want you to go over and I want you to reflect on what he's saying right here and look at the vision that he is casting for you and I. I'll just give you a few seconds. One, two, three. Go. What Jesus is saying here is revolutionary. Nobody has ever heard this before. He's telling them exactly what his kingdom is like, and he's linking it to something that we all want. What do we all want? Treasure. We all want treasure. And do you know what happens when you find a treasure? You get excited. At first, man, if you're walking through a field, if you guys were walking through a field, or if you guys were out hunting and you're walking through a field and you guys found a treasure, the first thing that's going to happen is your face is going to do something different. It's going to have excitement. It's going to light up like, did I just find that? And then something's going to bubble to the surface in your heart, man. And you know what that is? That's joy. You're going to have joy. You may even jump up and down and do a few woo-hoos. You may turn around a couple times. You'd be like, I cannot believe what just happened here. Listen, Jesus is sharing this passage. Actually, he's just speaking. I'm sharing the passage. He's speaking to a group of people who have never possessed a treasure. You see, treasure, when he says treasure, when Jesus is sharing this, that was reserved for kings and emperors. They can picture it in their head. It's just so far out of reach. They're like, man, I never thought. And what he's telling them is that the kingdom of heaven is like a treasure hidden in a field. And when a man found it, he hid it again. And in his joy, he went and sold all he had, and he bought that field. 
But let's just look at that word treasure for a minute because there were people, that, as, Jesus, as Jesus taught, there were people listening to him that day that didn't know where their next meal was coming from. If you have a treasure, are you worried about where your next provision's coming from? Are you worried about where your next meal's coming from? Absolutely not. You can buy whatever you want. Why? Because you got a treasure. You, now you got joy. Now you've got provision. When you have a treasure, you want to know what else you have? You've got peace. Because you're not worried about striving anymore. You've been provided for. You're satisfied. Do you want to know what else you have? You have rest. So you've got joy You've got peace. You've got rest. You know what else you have when you have a treasure? You have security. What are things that each and every one of us long for and look for in this life? We look for joy. We look for peace. We look for rest. We look for security. Where did Jesus tell us we could find all of that? Told us we could find it in him. Told us we could find it in his kingdom. The kingdom of of heaven is like a treasure. This morning, if you are looking for joy, if you're looking for peace, if you're looking for rest, if you're looking for fulfillment, if you're looking for contentment, you can have it, and it's found in Jesus. And then Jesus goes on, and if we just stop, what he's saying, the depth and the meaning of what Jesus is saying here is incredibly profound. So he tells us, he's linking what we want to the kingdom of heaven, and then he tells us how to get it. What did the guy do to get the treasure in the field? He went, found it, hid it again, and then in his what? Joy, he went and sold all he had so that he could have that treasure. Here's what I'm going to tell you something. Again, when Jesus speaks, the depth of meaning is absolutely incredible. But I bet that there was something in that man's life that he treasured. I bet he had a possession that he treasured that was super important to him. Does anybody else own anything that you really treasure? You look at that and you're like, man, it is good to own that thing. Maybe it's an outfit, maybe it's a car, maybe it's a house, maybe it's a wardrobe. I bet there's something in your life that you treasure. That guy treasured something. And do you know what he did? When he saw the kingdom of heaven and he compared it to everything that he had, in his great joy, he considered it all garbage. Sounds like the Apostle Paul. And he traded it. He sold it so that he could possess the kingdom of God. Jesus is telling us, if you want my kingdom, if you want to be a citizen in my kingdom, it is for you. But you must trade everything you have in order to get it. But it is so good, you would gladly give all you have to possess all he has. When is the last time you thought about that? When is the last time you thought about how good is it that God would love me so much that he would allow me to possess his kingdom and I can trade everything I have for everything he has? Do you understand the totality of what that means? We can trade our striving. We can trade all of our stuff. Maybe that's all you got. Maybe, maybe you don't have a whole lot to offer, but do you know you get to trade that for his kingdom? You give him what you have and you get to receive all that he has? He's a powerful vision. There's a moment in your life where somebody told you about the kingdom of God, where somebody told you how much Jesus loved you, and that was so moving, it was so gripping, it was so compelling, you went to Jesus and you said, I'll give you everything that I got. You can have all of me, you can have all this stuff, you can have my fear, my shame, my guilt, you can have all of my brokenness, I, and I get your kingdom, sign me up for that. That sounds like a treasure to me. Some of you have done that. Some of you are wondering if you can. If you've done that, whether it was a minute ago, whether it was an hour ago, whether it was a year ago, whether it's 10 years ago, let me just ask you something. Have you traded his treasure for a trinket? I wonder if anybody this morning is holding on to something other than the kingdom and treasuring it above him. You see, if you hold on to anything other than, other than the treasure of the kingdom of heaven, apathy is going to creep back in your life. You're going to get stuck in ruts. If you're 
And that's called idolatry. If you're holding on to an idol this morning, let it go. Grab back hold, take back hold, live in the promises and in the reality of the kingdom of heaven, which is love and joy and peace and security and rest. That is for you. If you're holding on to anything else today, let that go and grab hold of that. Trade whatever you're holding on for, for that, because that, what he has for you, far outweighs anything that you're holding on to. Jesus tells us that's how we can have the kingdom of God. Trade what we have for everything that he has. And we read this in Matthew chapter 13. And we read this just a few times in the gospel. But I promise you, everywhere Jesus went, he shared the vision of the kingdom of heaven. And he let people know everywhere in every city that he went to, in every road that he went down, in every market that he found himself in, in every synagogue that he found himself in, in every person he found himself around, he taught the good news of the kingdom of God. And it was the greatest news, it is the greatest news that has ever been shared with humanity, and that is a vision that has gripped your life. It is a reason that you're here today, and here's a beautiful thing. We're all followers of Jesus. And he told us to imitate him and do like him. And so this is a vision that needs to be carried on. If that vision impacted your life, imagine how it could impact the lives of the people around you. That's a question the staff and the board and the leadership and myself, along with other people, have been seeking God for. We're like, God, we know that you have created this church. The mission of this church is to help people pursue and run after God and love people like Jesus. But what would you have us do? You see, Jesus' ministry didn't come out of something out of his own. It came out of the heart of God. And we've been praying as a staff and as a leadership, Lord, give us a vision for this church that would come and flow out of your heart that would make a difference like that vision right there. And so our team, we gathered and we prayed and we met for a two-day of intensive meeting where we kicked things around and we came out with a vision that is at the heartbeat of this deal right here. So if you're taking notes, here's the vision. Over the next five years, Highland Park Community Church is going to follow in the footsteps of Jesus where every road we go down, every store we go into, every restaurant that we're at, whether we have to go to a hospital, whether we're doing a visitation, whether, whether, whether we're with our family, whether we're hanging out with our neighbor, whether we're hanging out with our friends, whether we're hobbying or whether we're lobbying. Highland Park Community Church is on a mission to embrace the vision God has given us of being a church that has 50,000 Jesus conversations a year. Everywhere, God, everywhere Jesus went, he had a kingdom of heaven conversation. Today, we can follow his example and have Jesus conversations wherever we go. And this is what a Jesus conversation is. A Jesus conversation is simply seizing the opportunity to share Jesus. You can't force it. You can't manipulate it. You can't break a door down. And you certainly don't make it awkward. You just go where you go. Goes all the way back to Romans 12, 1 and 2. You remember we talked about that in Unclutter? How's Romans 12, 1 and 2 start? Lord, we're going to take our everyday ordinary life. We're going to take our sleeping, our eating, our going to work, our walking around life, and we're going to place it before you as a offering. Embracing what you have done for me is the best thing that I could do. And should you open an opportunity, I'll seize that opportunity to have a Jesus conversation. So there's many ways to have Jesus' conversation. He didn't just go around preaching. You know, he would pray for people. You know, one of the ways that you can share with, uh, Jesus with folks is simply by praying for them, praying with them, getting in their stuff, their life with them, and praying God's best for them. It's powerful. Absolutely, it'd be life-changing. You see, you may not have, and I don't have the, I, I, we can't change somebody's life, but you know who can? Jesus. Prayer is powerful. It's not powerless. 
The greatest, one of the greatest gifts outside of Jesus that God has given us is to get to prayer. We can pray with people. Jesus prayed with people. and We share Jesus. The other way that Jesus would care for people is he would just dive into their life with them. He'd listen to their pain, and then he would do something about it. We can care for people just like Jesus cared for people. We want to what? Love people like Jesus. You just doing a random act of kindness, but telling them where that random act of kindness originates, not just paying for somebody at the gas pump, not just buying groceries, not just showing up to do this, but backing it up and letting them know why you're there because God has already done something for you, letting them know I'm doing this out of the abundance that God has done for me. It's changed life. Another way that we can share Jesus is just do what Jesus did. Just talk about the kingdom of heaven. Everywhere you go, just like he did, is an opportunity for you to share. Over the past 12 hours, I have heard two, two Jesus conversations that are just inspiring. Here's what I'll tell you. Our job is to plant the seed, water the seed, but whose job is it to make it grow? God's. What did you say? Paul says, it's my job to plant seeds, water seeds. God's job to make it. It's God's job to make it grow. Let me just tell you two planting, watering stories. I had a buddy text me late last night. He goes, dude, Jesus conversations. I love them. He says, man, let me tell you one that will just blow you away. I said, cool, man. So he texts this, texts this to me and he says, hey, uh, I had an opportunity to hire somebody that nobody else would hire. And he asked me why I would hire him and I told him about Jesus. And, and man, we made sure that I didn't just tell him that Jesus loved him, but we backed it up by putting some money in his check. And then, uh, man, we did some work together for a while and then life happened and we separated and we went our own different ways. And then not too long ago, he received a text that the man was in hospice and he was on his deathbed and the only guy he wanted to talk to was the guy who took a risk on him and hired him when nobody else would. And so my buddy went over there and the guy said, I just have one question for you. Why did you take a chance on me when nobody else would? And the guy just simply said, that's easy. Because Jesus took a chance on me when nobody else would and he just loved me. And the guy said, sign me up for that. Sign me up for that. All he did was plant seeds, water seeds, and it took years. God made it grow. 24 hours, that, 24 hours later, that man left this earth and stepped into the arms of Jesus Christ. He's more alive today than he's ever been because somebody took the chance to do what Jesus did, cast a compelling vision about the kingdom of heaven, let him know it was for him. Jesus' conversation. Only 49,999 more to go. I had a buddy tell me last night about his friend who just sends texts. He just shoots texts out to people that God loves of verses. Well, one night he went out to eat and he sent out his text before he went out to eat. But God got him right where he wanted him to be in the same restaurant was one of his friends that he sent that verse out to. And he came walking by the table and he saw his friends and the guy's like, dude, did you just send this to me? He says, yes, I just sent you that verse. And the guy began to break down and he's like, this is exactly what I needed. And all the dude did was have a Jesus conversation. He planted a seed, he watered the seed, God made it grow, and the guy in a restaurant says, sign Sign me up for Jesus. It's what Jesus told us to do. Go and be like him. So what we're going to do as a church is we're going to be a church that has 50,000 Jesus conversations a year. That is ambitious. Why 50,000? Because it's tens of thousands more than what's going on right now. But more than that, if you look at the population of Casper, Wyoming, it says 55,000. And when our team, or roughly around 55,000, when our team gathered, we said, you know what, I bet we could, out of the 55,000, I bet there's probably 5,000 people who are passionately and regularly running after Jesus in our town. So I bet that we'd probably get to that number, which means there are 50,000 people who have either rejected God, who are apathetic towards God, or know nothing of his love. And doesn't that sound like the church? To come and have a Jesus conversation. You know what? I bet for the person who's laying in a hospital room, who thinks that the sum of their illnesses is going to be the final word, if somebody to walk into that room and let them know that there is one who knows the number of their days, who cares for them deeply, and who has the power and authority to heal them in this life or this life to come, that news would sound like treasure to them. 
I bet there's some people that you know that are carrying some baggage around, some fear, some guilt, some shame. That if they knew that they could be forgiven for the stuff that they've done, I bet that would sound like treasure to them. I bet there's some people that you know, and maybe you are that somebody, who has never known what true love feels like. And to know that you are loved so much that the, the Son of God would lay down his life for you, I bet that would sound like treasure to somebody. and They would say, sign me up for that. So how do we get there? This way, check out this video. Sign me up for following Jesus like that. 50,000 taking risks to pursue God and love people like Jesus. Man, 50,000 planting, planting seeds, watering seeds. Sign me up for that. So how are we going to get to the number 50,000? Like you eat an elephant, one bite at a time. So here's what I'm asking you to do in 2019. I'm asking you to have one more Jesus conversation than you did last year. Meaning... If you didn't have any Jesus conversations with your neighbors or wherever you were at, I'm asking you to have one more. Have one in 2019. I promise you, if you have one, by the time you get to the end of 2019, if you were to look back at 19, it will be in your top five greatest things that you celebrate at the end of the year if you had one this year. If having Jesus conversations is in a regular routine for you wherever you go, have one more. And if we will get in the attitude and the behavior of looking for opportunities wherever we went, just like Jesus did, we'll be able to hit that number 50,000 in five years and be a church that has 50,000 Jesus conversations a year. We blanket cast for Wyoming. But I think that that number is low five years from now. I think we can exceed that number. And I look forward to what God has in store. Now, there's enough ambition in this room. There's enough excitement that would say, let's go get it. Let's go do it. Here's the problem. When we do this in our own power, it's going to be guaranteed to flop. Somebody taught me a long time ago, when man works, man works. But when man prays, God works. So what are we going to do? Over the next 21 days, I'm going to ask you to go on an adventure with me. A crazy, God-given crazy adventure, man, where God's going to lead you to crazy wild places, put people in front of you, put people in opportunities in front of you that you never dreamed possible, man. Whether it's the OR at a restaurant, wherever you go, there's going to be opportunities, adventures that abound. Some of them be absolutely terrifying, but here's what I'm going to ask you to do. I'm going to ask you to join me in praying for the next 21 days. 
You see, prayer isn't optional for a follower of Jesus. It is essential. And I would tell you that the one thing that does not scare the enemy is a church and a people that does not pray. We don't pray, the enemy doesn't have to bother us because we're working out of our own power. But if we would operate out of the power of the Holy Spirit living inside of us, if we would seek God and that ministry would flow out of his heartbeat through us, God will do something transformational in us and through us and it starts with prayer. That we would be a praying people for the next 21 days. I'm going to ask you to pray. If you haven't picked up this journal, before you leave, they've got them all over the place. Pick this thing up. Get inside a community group. This is simply a tool. That's all it is, is to create a habit of prayer in your life. What are we trying to do through this thing? Create intimacy with you and God. The, the love of the Father, that his heart would, would spill into your life and flow through your life in rhythms of prayer. Get this thing. Make this part of your daily walk for the next 21 days, actually there's 30 days in here, so go for that. But here's the other thing I'm going to ask you to do. I'm going to ask you to give something up as you seek God, as you create this rhythm, as you pray for the vision of Highland Park Community Church that he's given us. I'm going to ask you to fast. Give something up. Last year we prayed and we fasted the first 21 days of the year, seeking after God. And what we're going to do is we're going to do the same thing again. But here's what I'm going to ask you to do. Last year you gave something up. Do something even more difficult this year and say, God, I'm going to give you this. I'm going to forgo this to let you know how serious I am about being the church. Some of us have to stop going to church. Some of us need to start being the church. Pray fast. Say, God, I'll give you everything I got because I want all that you have. Let's not go to church. Let's be the church. And let's plant seeds and water seeds and see the adventures that God would take us on. Next week, we're going to continue. The disciples asked Jesus to do something for them. Next week, we're going to ask Jesus to do the same thing for us. Lord God, thank you for today. Thank you we get to worship you. In Jesus' name, amen.